Good afternoon and welcome to this webinar series on banking and finance. My name is Joe Hanho and I am a barrister here at 1396 Chambers and I'm joined here by my colleagues uh, Vivek and Philippe. Don't say a little bit about yourself. <laughs> uh, Vivek Kapoor, um, I am uh, also a barrister at 1396 uh, 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 Chambers and I have a practice uh, which uh, is uh, sits between commercial and construction work but, and banking and finance in the market. I'm a barrister as well. I specialize in civil fraud, banking, and shareholder disputes, and all matters cross border, both litigation and arbitration. Perfect. So I'm going to start by talking about the Queen's Care duty, moving on to the recent Supreme Court decision of Philip and Barclays, and Finally, Section 72 of this month, 2023, the reimbursement scheme for victims of APP fraud. I have quite a lot of slides, so I'm going to go through this at a canter. So it's important to start by looking at where it all began, which is Quinscare. And this is a case that was decided quite a long time ago now in 1988 by Mr. Justice Stainer C. Dan Wallace. It is a case that is both unremarkable and remarkable in different respects. And it's unremarkable because what it held seems at first blush to be quite unexceptional. And indeed, it's not even the first modern authority to look at the bank's duty regarding its mandate. And it laid dormant for quite a long time. What does make it remarkable is in the past seven years or so since Singularis that my colleague will talk about a little bit later on, it's become a real buzzword and a real source of hope for many deceived bank customers. We have to take quite a detailed look at what happened in there because the, the reasoning in Queen's Care was examined quite closely in, in the Supreme Court recently. So what happened there? Well, Queen's Care was an SPV to finance the purchase of four chemist shops. Barclays lent 400000 for the purpose, and unbeknownst to it, Mr. Stiller, Queen's Care's chairman, had used this as part of a fraud. What Mr. Stiller did was he instructed solicitors, Philip Adams and co, a firm in Bournemouth, to act. He then instructed Barclays to transfer about £350,000 as a drawdown of the loan to the solicitors. He then told the solicitors to transfer the money to a bank account in the USA, and then he disappeared. In the end, £9,000 was recovered. Mr. Stiller was caught, convicted, and spent four years in prison, and Queen's Care Limited, the SPV, became insolvent. Barclays was actually the claimant in this case, and it sued to recover the money's lend. And by the time it went to trial, the 400,000 loan had become something like 670,000 with these interests and the like. And the real target in that case was the second defendant, Unitem, a well known company who had guaranteed the loan. Quinn's Care ran a defense in the case, and there were four strands to that. The first is that there's an implied duty of care in the customer banker relationship. Secondly, there are certain circumstances that would put the banker on inquiry. In other words, when a reasonable banker has, has a form of reasonable suspicion that transaction was not actually authorized, then the banker has made more inquiries. Third, if no inquiry was made, then that was negligent. And fourth, the quantum of damages of the negligence is the loss suffered as a result. And so it ran that as a defense to say, no, I, I do not actually owe you any money. Now, we need to look at the, the judgment and the reasoning in some detail. So the judge first noted that in this relationship, Barclays was acting as Queen Care's agent in paying out the money. And that's because the customer sorry, the bank is the customer's debtor and was paying out the customer's money per the mandate that it was given. And as the agent paying out the money, Barclays owed fiduciary duties to Quinn's care. So, so far, so straightforward. He then went on to say, prima facie, every agent for reward has to exercise reasonable care and skill in carrying out instructions. 
And here, there's an implied contractual term that the bank will observe reasonable care and skill in executing the audits. And there was a coextensive duty in tort. What the judge said in his judgment, and it's set on the slide there, was that given that the bank owes a legal duty to exercise reasonable care in and about executing the customer's order, it is nevertheless a duty which must generally speaking be subordinate to the bank's other conflicting contractual duties. X hypothesis one is considering a case where the bank received a valid and proper order, which it is prima facie bound to execute promptly on pain of incurring liability for consequential loss to the customer. Then critically, he then weighed this up and he said, how are these conflicting duties to be reconciled in a case where the customer suffers loss because it is subsequently established that the order to transfer money was an act of misappropriation by the director or officer. So just pausing here, you can see in the judgment here how torn the judge was, that the starting point is the bank is there as an agent carrying out the instructions of the principal. Prima facie, when there's a valid and proper order, the bank has to carry it out promptly. It is not its money, it's carrying out its duties. But under what circumstances does it have to look further? He then went on in his judgment to say, the critical question is what lesser state of knowledge on the part of the bank will oblige the bank to make inquiries to the legitimacy of the order. He then talks about where the line should be drawn, the different policy considerations in that. He was highly cognizant that there should not be too high a burden on bankers, that many checks are received by banks that had to be cleared promptly for important business reasons where time was of the essence. But he also said, on the other hand, the law should guard against the facilitation of fraud and exact a reasonable standard of care, combat fraud and protect customers and innocent third parties. The key part of his judgment is the last paragraph there where he said, the sensible compromise strikes a fair balance between competing considerations is simply to say that a banker must refrain from executing an order if and for as long as the banker is put on inquiry in the sense that he has reasonable grounds for believing that the order is an attempt to misappropriate the funds for the company. He then went on to say everything will no doubt depend on the particular facts of each case. So you have to apply the facts to see what is reasonable. He looks at the different factors that are involved. And in the lower part of that passage, he says, uh, in the absence of telling indications to the contrary, a banker will usually approach a suggestion that a director of a corporate customer is trying to defraud the company with an initial reaction of instinctive disbelief. So pulling that together, what are the headlines we can take from Quinscare? I think it is this. What the judge said was a banker should not execute the order if he's on inquiry. It's highly fact sensitive. But when looking at the facts, unless they are telling indications, the starting point is the banker is quite right to approach it with a reaction of instinctive disbelief that a director is trying to defraud the company. Mere suspicion is not enough, nor does the bank need to play the role of amateur detective. Quince Care then uh, lay dormant for quite some time. It was considered by the Court of Appeal in Litkin Gorman, but it wasn't pursued in the House of Lords. It was deployed in many, many years later in 2001, unsuccessfully. Then came along Singularis, where for the first time, the phrase the Quince Care duty was actually used by a judge. And there, its allegation of breach succeeded. After Singularis, we're looking at the past seven years or so. So after Singularis, people got very excited, but before Philippe uh, got to the Supreme Court, these comments were made by Mrs. Justice Cockerill in the Federal Republic of Nigeria case. She said, it's fair to say that the Quince Care duty is one which has developed on a somewhat slender foundation. Authorities dealing with it have not been numerous and in academic terms, the direction of travel has been less than enthusiastically received. 
I, I think the judge was being quite English and uh, conservative in making those comments. <laughs> and she then quotes an article by Professor Peter Watts, who says, amongst other things, in rather more strident terms. It's a misstep, other jurisdictions should give it a wide berth. The notion that a junior agent should disobey a more senior agent uh, when the former has reasonable grounds to believe the latter is acting dishonestly is not a satisfactory general principle. And the only proper interests to be taken into account here are those of banker and customer. This is private law, and to lend any weight of extraneous public interests is a sideshow. He says quite pithily, it is Parliament's job to experiment, it is the common law's job to provide only the bedrock. Uh, Professor Watts will recur many times in the Supreme Court judgment in uh, Philip. Now, in uh, the Federal Republic of Nigeria, this is just this cockery will continue, where she said, despite the academic criticism and what's been urged by Professor Watts, the Queen's care duty plainly exists. And thus far, it's been seen only in what has been called internal fraud cases. In other words, when a fraud is within the company, it's an agent in the company, the director, the chairman, who tries to commit fraud. Philip now potentially extends that duty on its own terms, that potential extension relates to APP fraud. And in doing so, the Court of Appeal stated in terms that as a matter of law, the duty of care identified in Quinn's care does not depend on the fact that the bank is instructed by an agent of the customer of the bank. Now, just pausing there, it, it is important to note how striking and how important the impact of Philip and the Court of Appeal was. We, we've seen the Quinn's care duty or the concept of pleading a Quinn's care duty lie dormant for many years sprung to life quite recently in Singularis. A lot of hope placed on it by the victims of APP fraud. And for the first time in the Court of Appeal, Philip says, well, it can extend to, an, uh, to a case of external fraud. So it was actually a, a very important uh, opening of the door by the Court of Appeal. Now, Philip in the Court of Appeal was a unanimous decision uh, decided by senior Court of Appeal judges. The Chancellor himself, Lord Justices Coulson and Burst, decided that. It widened significantly the scope of Quint's care, and it deliberately overturned the orthodoxy at first instance, where His Honour Judge Russell KC, said his High Court judge, held the orthodox line that Quint's care was limited to internal fraud. And just as a reminder, what we're looking at here is APP, Authorised Push Payment Fraud, is authorized because uh, the, it, it's a case where the customer tells the bank that it wants to transfer the money, and uh, it, it's, it's the customer itself that makes that instruction. It's a push uh, payment because it's the customer who instructs that, or a pull payment where a third party tells the bank it wants the money transferred. And it's a fraud that's become more and more prevalent recently. What then happened in the Supreme Court, and why is it so important? The brief facts of Philip was that Mrs. Philip and her husband, Dr. Philip, were the victim of an APP fraud. And the frauds that deceived her to transferring some £700,000 to UAE bank accounts. The facts are worth a read. They were quite striking. It was an intelligent couple who were comprehensively deceived. They were warned by the police about the fraud. They went ahead. And indeed, after the bank uh, got Suspicious as well, uh, Mrs. Philip went into the branch and demanded that more monies beyond the 700,000 should be transferred and the bank refused. And Mrs. Philip gave a, a false account as to why it was being transferred. She was so sucked into the fraud that she did that. And when the fraud became apparent, she then sued the bank, arguing that there was a breach of the Queen's care duty and the bank owed a duty not to execute her instructions because the bank had reasonable grounds to believe that the instructions were an attempt to misappropriate her funds. And this went to the Supreme Court on the back of the bank applying for summary judgment on the basis that quids care only applied to internal fraud. In other words, the scenario where you have a company and it's a director or chairman of the company, someone authorized by the mandate trying to commit the fraud in that way. What the Supreme Court did very clearly was to restore the orthodoxy. 
it held very clearly that the Quinn's care duty only applies where the bank receives an instruction from the agent of the customer and there's reasonable grounds to believe the agent's defrauding the customer. So only internal fraud. Lord Leggett gave the, gave the leading judgment and he explained that the reason why the bank owes a duty to his customers to make inquiries is to ensure it does not make a payment which the customer has not authorized. And this simply does not apply to cases such as APD fraud, where the customer itself has unequivocally authorized and instructed the bank to make a payment. So very clear, only applies to, Quinn's care duty only applies to internal fraud, when an agent of the company is involved there. He then made reference to how this type of fraud was a growing social problem, and it was a matter of social policy for regulators, the government and ultimately parliament, to decide uh, whether banks have to reimburse victims for such crimes. And this was a clear, uh, clearly bore on his reasoning in Philip. He then looked closely at the reasoning uh, in Quint's care itself. And he said, if the reasoning in Quint's care, Quint's care was correct, and the Court of Appeal uh, did take a logical approach, but the analytical approach in Quint's care was wrong, and therefore, when it was followed by the Court of Appeal, was also wrong. And he explained why. He said the first flaw is to regard the bank's duty of care as potentially conflicting with his duty to execute his customer's payment instruction. Because when the bank receives a valid payment order, and there's no room for interpretation, and the bank's duty is to execute it. There's no duty of care. It's been told what to do by its principal, it just has to do it. The second flaw, which flows from the first, is that Mr. Justice Stain, as he then was, had no principal way to resolve this false problem. And what he then tried to do in finding the compromise was to resort to policy considerations, which was not an appropriate method to identify what duty is owed by a party pursuant to a contract. It's a matter for parliament. He then talked about how uh, and why the, the approach in Quinn's care was wrong. And it came from the false premise. And he emphasized that misuse of authority is different from absence of authority. I'll, in the interest of time, I'm going to move forward where I summarize what uh, Philip did hold. So here, these are the headline points of what Philip holds for. First, Quinn's care duty is limited only to internal fraud. It's closed the door very firmly on expanding that. Properly analyze the duty is the application of the general duty of care by a bank to interpret, ascertain, and act in accordance with the customer's instructions. In the case of internal fraud, when it's put an inquiry, it must not execute the instruction without first making inquiries. If it does execute instruction, such instruction without making inquiries, importantly, you'll be both in breach of duty and be acting outside the scope of its authority, outside of its mandate. And that's an important point because the customer does not have to go on to prove what the bank would have done had it made inquiries. If it acted outside of its mandate, then it gets its money back. So it doesn't apply when the customer is a victim of APP fraud, because in that case, the instructions validity is not in doubt. So what was the legislation which uh, Lord Liggett was concerned about? Well, in 2023, almost half a billion pounds had been lost to APP scams. And Section 72 of FISMA 2023 provided for a mandatory reimbursement scheme that came into effect this week. So it's currently law, it's in effect. It requires sending and receiving firms to split the cost 50-50 and is designed to be a really quick way of reimbursing victims. Victims should be reimbursed within five business days or that the bank can stop the clock if it needs more information. The bank also has a power to delay executing transactions for several days if it has suspicions. And again, it shows how Parliament has cast the owners on banks to to help to prevent such fraud, to educate consumers about such frauds, and to promptly reimburse customers if there's such a fraud. The maximum reimbursement under this, under this scheme is 85,000, 
although that will be reassessed after the policies, policy has been in place for at least a year. Now, APP fraud victims will not be eligible for reimbursement if there was gross negligence, but this doesn't apply to vulnerable customers. Now, when we talk about gross negligence here, we do not mean negligence in being scammed in entering into the fraud. The PSR guidance is clear. When we look at standard of care, we're looking at a fairly limited range of things, a lot of which is after the event. The requirement of regard to interventions, prompt reporting, information sharing, and then reporting this crime to the police. So what does the future hold for APP frauds now we have this framework? I think first and foremost, hopefully, such fraud will diminish with growing awareness and banks now having more skin in the game actively, proactively to educate consumers and warn them. For those that cause more than £85,000 in loss, Philip is very clear it shuts the door to any Quinn's care duty applying. But it did leave the door open to a loss of a chance claim if the bank did not act promptly after being put on notice. For those frauds of less than 85,000, most of these claims should be swiftly reimbursed by the new rules, but there may be potential disputes, I think unlikely but possible, regarding gross negligence and whether a customer is vulnerable. And there are also potential disputes if a customer chooses to go to force instead, which has a higher limit. The force would no doubt take into account what is fair and reasonable when looking at uh, the reimbursement rules. That still leaves internal fraud, the original type of fraud that Quinn's Care dealt with. Still very fact specific, but still a viable cause of action. Thank you, Johan. And I'll, I'll really pick up where you left. So, in corporate cases, so if you have a company bank account, as Johan said, Singularis still remains good law, and that's Supreme Court authority. We haven't chosen to go into detail on Singularis, given its antiquity, but really that's where Queen's Care is. And what I want to focus on in, in this next section is beyond Queen's Care, so alternative banking fraud claims, although I will touch on a variant of the Queen's Care duty, which was attempted and dealt with by the Privy Council in 2022 as well. And uh, just one final note on the, the statutory regime. As Johan mentioned, there is, apart from the 85,000 compensation, there is this power of delay. It's not enacted yet, but there are draft uh, regulations called the Payment Services Amendment Regulations 2024, which essentially would give banks a power to delay execution of an instruction um, by up to four days. And if they do so, the bank, on grounds of fraud, suspected fraud, and if the bank does that, and it applies also to other payment services providers, it is indemnified from um, claims by the customer in respect of the delay. So think of you know consequential losses and so on that may result from non-execution of the mandate. Um, so what I'm going to focus on is unjust enrichment, and I think I was certainly surprised to see Queen's Care being sort of re-argued under a different heading, the sort of APP fraud type claim being pursued as an unjust enrichment claim, but it has been attempted very recently, and we now have a commercial court judgment, uh, Turner Energy and Revolut, uh, from earlier this year. It's a judgment of his honor, Judge uh, Paul Matthews. And I should say at the outset that uh, permission to appeal has been granted. So uh, that's why I say yes in principle, really for two reasons. So the question is, can it be argued that an a in an APP fraud, the receiving bank, i.e. the bank of the fraudster, is unjustly enriched after it has paid out the proceeds of the fraud? So instead of going after your own bank as a, a deceived customer, can you sue the receiving bank? And based on Turner, uh, the answer is yes in principle, um, in the sense that the matter will at least go to trial if Turner 
is correctly decided. Whether you win on the facts of your case is going to be fact sensitive. And personally, I'm, I'm slightly skeptical, but there isn't yet a reported decision at the trial stage on unjust enrichment and its application in this context. So it's certainly a very interesting and topical uh, new doctrine or application of the doctrine in this space. I've set out the facts of Turner in some detail on the slide, and that's really taken from some of the key paragraphs in the judgment. But I'm just going to summarize this. Essentially, you have Turner instructing its bank, which was Unicredit in Serbia, uh, to pay about 700,000 euros to an account with the applicant, which was the party applying for summary judgment, um, held by uh, Zedna Fashions Limited. So the applicant is Revolut, the account holder was Zedna Fashions Limited, an English company. Um, in the usual course, you have dissipation of assets after that payment is received and you know no viable recourse against the actual fraudsters, at least by the look of it. And then the next paragraph sets out in some detail how the fraud came about. Essentially, you know, what happened was there was a genuine email from uh, an energy supplier requesting payment of a million euros. Then there was a fake email attaching uh, non-genuine bank details, which were the fraudsters' bank details, and then another genuine email from the actual utility company. So this a case probably where you can have quite a lot of sympathy for the victim given how it arose. And the detail is set out more fully, um, but I don't think the, the, the details matter so much in terms of the legal analysis. The judge then sets out at paragraph 20 how the payment came about, um, partly because there were arguments which I'll touch on about Revolut at the time not being a conventional bank, but being an electronic money institution, so an EMI, which is under slightly different regulations, which includes uh, obligations to segregate funds. But in terms of the payment mechanism, as set out there, really the nub of it is that you have funds moving through different correspondent banks. So it's not a sort of linear process, nor is it actual funds moving, it's, it's just debts and credits moving across in the usual way. And I think that's an important point to reiterate, you know, these are not proprietary claims where you're tracing into particular funds. And that's the point that uh, Paul Matthews made in the judgment. And that's why I make the comment that things are, in my view, rarely going to turn on the precise payment mechanism unless there is really a, an interposition of another third party that fundamentally changes what is a simple transfer from one entity to another. And this is just a quick recap on the, the basic requirements of unjust enrichment as set out in the Supreme Court decision in investment trust companies, which is a 2018 judgment. So. A four-stage analysis, has the defendant been benefited in the sense of being enriched? So that's generally called the enrichment question. Was the enrichment at the claimant's expense? C, was the enrichment unjust? And D, are there any defenses? So common defenses are uh, change of position. Another one that I think is being pleaded by Revolut but wasn't determined on this summary judgment strikeout application was ministerial receipt. Um, so there are many exceptions or defenses. So even if you get through the initial hurdles, that doesn't mean you have a viable claim. And one point that was stressed by the judge, and I agree with, is that this is just a sort of classification. It's a way in which modern authorities have divided the cause of action into distinct elements. But in all the cases, there wasn't the same taxonomy. And so when you're looking at all the cases as the judge did, it can sometimes be difficult to see whether a claim succeeded or failed because of a lack of enrichment or because of a defense. And that assumed quite a lot of importance in the judge's view in Turner. 
Um, Revolut applied for reverse summary judgment, alternatively to strike out Turner's unjust enrichment claim and relying on two grounds, really limbs A and B of the four part test from investment trust services. So it said Revolut has not been enriched for the purposes of the doctrine of unjust enrichment. In any event, the enrichment was not at the expense of the claimant, i.e. Turner. And in terms of the approach, and this also, I think, affects the precedential value, which is why I said, yes, in principle, you know, all the court is doing on a summary judgment application is to decide a claim if it feels that on the law and assuming the facts to be as they are pleaded, subject to any sort of really clear evidence or demonstrably wrong facts being pleaded, um, all, all it's doing is deciding whether the claim is hopeless or has no real prospect of success. And given this was really a summary judgment application purely on a legal point, i.e. enrichment and at the claimant's expense, um, it's worth remembering, and the judge referred to this, the approach set out by the Privy Council in Altimo. Um, so that, that's a relevant authority in, in this context as well. And the judge then dealt with the enrichment issue really in, in quite a lot of detail. Um, paragraphs 30 to 62 are really a, a detailed you know, case analysis. And one judgment that he criticized in particular was a first instance decision of Mr. Justice Sales, as he then was, in a, a case called Jeremy D. Stone Consultants Limited and Nat West, and that's a 2013 Chancery Division decision. And essentially, what he had to say about that was um, on the enrichment issue, it was either obiter or wrong or both. And instead, as I've set out at uh, para 63 here on the slide, he went back to some much older cases from the House of Lords and the Court of Appeal, um, which in his view state that the bank's becoming of the customer is not an answer to the claim, at, at least unless and until it is proved that the bank has paid away the money in accordance with the customer's instruction and without notice of the payer's claim. And he says all of these cases proceed on the basis that there is an enrichment. So in other words, the claims fail because of uh, a defense or a lack of unjustness rather than the bank not being enriched. And that's where he disagrees with Mr. Justice Sales, who had reached the opposite view in uh, Jeremy D. Stone. And then he deals with the point saying, you know, as a matter of authority, um, he considers himself bound by those older cases. And then he says, in any event, he would have preferred the reasoning in those cases to that of uh, Mr. Justice Sales and other first instance cases that had followed sales. On the facts then, I mean, having set out the law in that way, it's, it's quite simple. I mean, you, you quite clearly get over the enrichment hurdle because you move the analysis to the later stages of the test. So he finds an enrichment and he also disposed of this EMI argument. So in, in other words, Revolut said because it was an EMI, there was a degree of separation and it therefore wasn't in the same position as a conventional bank, even if those authorities applied. The judge said, you know, the fact of the matter is it is really no difference in substance for present purposes because the bank does still get the legal and beneficial interest in the monies received. So he made the point and it wasn't disputed that Revolut would have earned interest and other income on those funds in the usual way. I mean, that, that is its business and it doesn't matter that it's merely an EMI and it has some additional restrictions on what it can do with the customer's funds. And as I say, so Revolut is enriched. Then the next question, enriched at the claimant's expense. This is more technical and, and I won't say too much about it, but it turns on uh, a more recent Supreme Court uh, or a different aspect of investment trust companies which was about direct and indirect transfers of value. 
And there's a very interesting, although maybe slightly academic or technical discussion, but essentially what the judge did is he said um, a previous case called Techni Monteravia, in which the unjust enrichment point had been raised, although it wasn't central to the claim, that was a decision of his honor, Judge Bird, was wrongly decided. I mean, he, he felt that it clearly has to be an en enrichment at the claimant's expense, and Technimont was wrong, and he then gives his reasons, saying that this is an indirect transfer case on the basis of debiting and crediting through the sequence of bank transfers. And again, if he's right, that would seem to apply in almost any bank transfer. I mean, it, it's not unique to the particular payment mechanism, and he certainly didn't give that impression. What is the status of Turner? As I said, a first instance decision on a summary judgment application. PTA has been granted, although for the moment, the judge's reasoning on those first two limbs seems quite cogent, unless the Court of Appeal or the Supreme Court were to find that the previous House of Lords and Court of Appeal authorities were wrong. And that's, that's possible. They are old and there may be additional arguments to be had. And, you know, as I say there, you know, you, you, you would be a bit, maybe not foolish, but bullish to rush off and bring an unjust enrichment claim on the basis of turn up tomorrow. I mean, I think the prudent <coughs> advice, unless you're up against limitation, would be to watch this space and maybe wait for the Court of Appeal Authority before you spend a lot of money. But it's worth getting advice on these sorts of issues. And I won't spend as much time on this one, conscious also of Vivek's uh, section still to come, but Royal Bank of Scotland and uh, JPSP4 is a 2022 Privy Council case. Essentially here, the interesting issue was whether there was a duty of care in negligence, and it wasn't just pleaded as Queen's care, although that was one of the ways in which it was being presented, is owed to a person who is known by the bank to be the beneficial owner of the monies in the account, but isn't the customer. And the way this arose was the fund was the beneficial owner of the relevant funds. Those funds were held for purpose of investing in litigation funding in England and Wales. The customer was an Isle of Man SPV, S-I-O-M, and the relevant account was held with RBS. And in the usual way, at least as far as these cases go, there was wrongdoing and money that beneficially belonged to the fund was paid out. And the fund chose to pursue RBS to see whether a recovery could be made. And the alleged duty is set out there. I'm, I'm not going to read it, but it's essentially a, a negligence duty in in the protection of a beneficial owner. And this was then dealt with again as a summary judgment uh, strikeout application arising out of the Isle of Man, but nothing turns on that. Um, essentially the same as English common law for these purposes. And the fund tried to frame it as Queen's care duty. They also relied on a trust case called Barden, assumption of responsibility and as a sort of Hail Mary incremental development of the law of negligence. And the Privy Council rejected all those grounds. The focus really is on Queen's Care and Barden. Um, on Queen's Care, it said, and this is pre Philip, but I don't think this is affected by that decision. It's, if anything, even more compelling now. Um, the Queen's Care duty is limited to the customer of the bank, and that's entirely consistent with what Philip said about internal and external fraud. It dealt with the Barden point on the basis that that authority wasn't authority in light of changes in the law of negligence as to the scope of duty questions. That's Anna Mertens going back to the 1980s, and the other grounds really were quite hopeless. And what is the effect of uh, Philip and Bank of Scotland? Um, I think this should be clear by now, but just to summarize, the Queen's Care duty doesn't apply 
to an APP fraud with an individual customer. It only applies in the singularis type uh, scenario where you have an agent, uh, say an authorized signatory or a director giving the relevant instruction. And this sort of argument on behalf of a beneficial owner is not going to wash whether as a Queen's claim or, or something else. And with that, over to Vivek. Uh, thank, thank you, uh, Philippe. Uh, I'm going to slightly change gears, but before I do that, can I please remind you we have a Q&A function and uh, you can put your questions uh, in there. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be quick and then we will be able to take a few uh, questions before we uh, let you get back to work. So as I said, I'm going to be changing gears. I am going to be talking about claims against banks and financial institutions arising from bribery and corruption. Now, uh, in, in this day and age, um, all banks uh, in this jurisdiction and ac uh, across the world have very sophisticated bribery and uh, corruption systems and controls. However, despite that, we have seen that there has been an increase in enforcement actions involving financial institutions, as well as increase in civil claims alleging bribery and corruption. Uh, now, as banks and financial uh, institutions prioritize growth in regions which have high risk, and these risks are often compounded by uh, macroeconomic and geopolitical risks, um, I expect that we will see uh, an increase in bribery and corruption related investigations and litigation. Now, the, the investigations are not my focus today, so essentially the FCA, uh, SFO type uh, cl uh, claims are not what I'm uh, thinking about today. What my focus today is about uh, uh, the litigation risk and the claims that will arise in the civil courts. Now, to this list, we can also add, um, oops. yeah. So to this list, we can also add sanctions and money laundering, but we, we, we are not discussing that today. So I think with the bribery, corruption, uh, sanctions and money laundering, these are the sort of uh, four big um, ticket risks that um, banks and financial institutions face. Now, what uh, the four claims that uh, I uh, think that we can expect are the first uh, claims from counterparties alleging transactions were procured by bribery, uh, claims from uh, counterparties alleging transactions were tainted by corruption. I think this is part of the broader trend of uh, increasing fraud claims in banking and finance litigation and arbitration. Uh, shareholder claims under Section 90A of the uh, FSMA 2000 against financial institutions allegedly uh, that have failed to disclose bribery and corruption issues. Now, this can be all or even adequately. And then uh, Quinn's uh, claims, whatever uh, remains, we, you know, Joanne talked about uh, this in detail, so I'm not going to uh, repeat. Now, let's first look at uh, transactions procured by bribery. Now, it will come as no surprise to anyone attending today that under English law, a contract procured by bribery is voidable and may be set aside. Sorry. We're having a bit of confusion <laughs> regarding uh, a few things. Um, and so, as I was saying, uh, under English law, a uh, contract procured by bribery is voidable and may be set aside at the election of the innocent party. So essentially, a contract can be unwound. Now, bribery can include giving various advantages by bank employees or in agents, including money, gifts, entertainment, jobs. I, I don't think Taylor Swift tickets count, but I think you get the gist. Uh, now, importantly, the party seeking to unwind a contract does not have to prove a criminal offence has been committed. The civil concept of bribery is based on the concept of a secret commission or a secret benefit being paid to an agent or employee uh, of principle by the person aware of the nature of relationship between the agent and employee and the principal. Now, there's a very interesting uh, case of uh, Petro, uh, Petro Trade Inc. versus Smith. This is a 2000 case which I will uh, commend to you. Now, essentially, if a, a bank or financial institution's agent has bribed an employee or an official and counterparty, it is possible that the entire deal may later be set aside. Now, uh, 
In terms of recent examples, I think I, I would say there are some not so recent examples, but I think we will see uh, some claims being uh, brought to run some of the investigations that are currently uh, ongoing. Uh, I think uh, some of you uh, might remember in, 19, uh, in uh, 2014, uh, the Libyan Investment Authority brought a civil bribery claim against the French bank in relation uh, to transactions in the period of uh, 2007 uh, to 2010. Uh, the LI sought to unwind those transactions. It alleged that the Panamian registered company was owned by a Libyan businessman and that the uh, payment of 58 million US dollars to it by the bank was a bribe. The case was settled before trial. Uh, LI had a related claim uh, which was not on uh, bribery but on undue influence, and that was against Goldman Sachs that played out uh, in the courts in 2016. There is an interesting judgment, uh, uh, Libyan Investment Authority versus Goldman Sachs, if somebody is interested. Uh, but essentially, uh, the even though bribery was not uh, the sort of central issue, there was that uh, issue of uh, the uh, the deputy brother of the chairman of LIA's, uh, his, uh, I think it was nephew or son, um, or I think it was brother, being offered an internship at Goldman Sachs. And obviously there were other allegations uh, that were made. Uh, in 2017, which was uh, quite a notable case, the Court of Appeal held that the German water company uh, could uh, rescind a credit protection contract in relation to derivatives entered in with UBS on the basis of bribes paid by the company's financial uh, advisor upholding the first instance uh, decision in that case. The Court of Appeal importantly rejected the first instance finding that the financial uh, advisor was the bank's agent. The financial advisor had formally been engaged by the company and the bank had been unaware of the bribes. However, the majority considered that the bank could not enforce the transaction as even though it was not aware of the bribe, it dishonestly assisted in the financial advisor's breach of its fiduciary duties, in particular, the duty to provide loyal and disinterested uh, assistance. Advice. Uh, the company ha uh, had been entitled to decide whether the, to continue the credit protection uh, contract or rescind it, that is cancelled, uh, with the effect that the parties would be put in their uh, respective pre-contractual positions. The company obviously uh, uh, elected to rescind, which uh, uh, required it to return the 30 million premium, but enabled to, uh, to avoid paying out 137 million under the credit protection contract. Now, uh, bank and financial in, uh, institutions are particularly susceptible to, uh, to claims to unwind transactions. Uh, the top tip uh, that uh, I, I would give, you know, looking at some of the cases I've been involved in, is to understand the role of third parties. If you're acting as a bank or financial institution or uh, you are acting against them, the role of third parties can be very uh, important in uh, situations like that. Uh, now, transactions are tainted by corruption. Um, the risk of civil claims against banks uh, are arising uh, out of bribery and corruption or is not confined to uh, transactions procured by bribery. It also uh, yeah, goes to uh, transactions where sums have been advanced by banks and financial institutions uh, and those sums are used for corrupt purposes. I think that is, uh, again, a, a field that is widening quite quickly when it comes to claims against banks and financial uh, institutions. Uh, Banks and financial institutions regularly enter into finance transactions with sovereign governments, which I think is uh, uh, what, uh, a potential minefield when it comes to uh, corruption claims. The, the risk arises when a bank or financial institution may have reason to suspect that much of the sums advanced is going to be diverted to corrupt government officials. Uh, the uh, immediate risk is that the project where the money is uh, being uh, fund the project that's being funded may not be completed and might be stopped or unwound. But even if uh, they're able to recover their money through third party or sovereign uh, guarantees, there's still uh, a number of claims that uh, the bank can be exposed to, the most obvious being unlawful means conspiracy. Now, for uh, a claim of unlawful means conspiracy to succeed, it is necessary to establish uh, the use of the unlawful means, that is the fraud in furtherance of an agreement 
and an intention to cause injury to the borrower. It is not necessary to show a binding contractual agreement as between the bank and the fraudster. A tacit agreement or understanding or combination is uh, likely to suffice. Uh, on, on, a, on a very practical level, uh, from an evidential point of view, linking the bank to the uh, fraudster in the government is often less um, difficult than is actually appreciated. Now, an intention to cause injury in a claim like this can be established where it can be reasonably be foreseen that the conspiracy might cause loss to the borrower. If the parties are aware that the funds are going to be diverted for corrupt purposes rather than the purpose uh, the transaction was uh, initially intended for, that is likely to be sufficient. The biggest uh, problem usually arises from turning a blind eye uh, because that will constitute knowledges, uh, knowledge for these purposes. Now, a case in point is the mammoth uh, litigation brought by the Republic of Mozambique against credit suites and others about loans to finance a tuna fishery and other projects backed by sovereign guarantees, which Mozambique alleges were enabled by fraud and bribery. Um, a three month trial recently commenced, there were obviously minus a Fred Suisse's new current UBS because of last month's settlement. But another claim um, that is playing out is uh, the Ukrainian bank, um, PGSC Commercial Bank, Private Bank, uh, suing its former owners, alleging misappropriation of 19 billion US dollars, which is, um, as I said, also in the middle of a long running trial. Now, the third one is. Uh, I think the, a very interesting uh, gateway, which hasn't been extensively used, and that uh, is shareholder claims under Section 90A of Air SFMA 2000 against financial institutions alleged to have failed to disclose bribery and corruption issues. That can be at all uh, as a no disclosure, or even if the disclosure is uh, inadequate. So that covers both misleading statements as well as omissions. Now, all companies with securities traded on UK securities markets are required to make a number of disclosures to the market each year. The Companies Act, sections uh, uh, 395, 396 require production of annual accounts, the obligation to produce interim accounts is derived from the, the Transparency Directive, and then there is an obligation to report to the market on a continuing basis. The prompt and fair store of information uh, to the public enhances consumer protection and market efficiency, which are obviously the core uh, objectives of these directives. Uh, now, where there is selective and inaccurate disclosure by security issuers, uh, and that leads to a loss of investor confidence, uh, it ultimately leads to uh, a loss of confidence in the integrity of the financial markets. And uh, we have seen a number of uh, scandals in recent times uh, Notable ones have been, you know, the, the Tesco 250 million accounting error in uh, 2014, uh, the BT 225 million accounting error in 2017, the Petrofag bribery controversy uh, in 2017, and then allegations involving Carillion uh, months before it collapsed in 2017. And uh, for uh, those who uh, liked uh, the history gallery, that was again another accounting scandal in 2018. Now, investor claims uh, claiming to have suffered loss as a result of such false reporting may seek to take advantage of Section 90A, which is essentially a deceit-based statutory clause of action, uh, cause of action, which offers a fraud measure of damages and thereby allows a successful claimant to seek damages for losses arising from uh, market movements which are unrelated to false reporting. Now, there's been a, a recent case, uh, ACN Netherlands versus Lynch uh, 2022, uh, which has shed some light on the practical uh, applications of the Section 90 provision. However, uh, a large part of the provision are still uh, to be discussed in details in terms of case law. So, while there's some guidance on what is published information, what is reliable uh, reliance, the big questions still. Uh, uh, remain about the meaning of dishonesty, especially in the context of emissions, causation, limitation periods, and issue of quantum. Now, this is likely to be uh, a, a gateway that uh, is going to be used more often than it has been in the past. I think that the two reasons for that is the English court's uh, increasingly sophisticated approach to group litigation 
and uh, the growth of shareholder activism. So quite interestingly, in 2023, as some of you might know, institutional investors uh, filed claims under Section 90 and 90A, and it's clear for and uh, retrofit respectively. Now, I, I realize I'm running out of time, so what I'm going to do before I stop is Right, what are the, the, the three areas of risk? Uh, I'm just going to talk about the headline point, third parties, I've already talked about that. Uh, the next one is uh, interaction with government officials, and the third one is non-UK subsidiary and joint ventures in high-risk markets. Uh, I think the, the first two are quite obvious, but, uh, Interestingly, non-UK subsidiaries and joint ventures in high-risk markets are often ignored. And uh, I think it's important to bear in mind that even in those situations, uh, there can uh, be liability. Uh, in, in the environmental space, we've seen some uh, cases where uh, uh, there is uh, quite a potential when it comes to claims uh, in involving corruption and uh, bribery as well. I'm now going to pause. We've had some questions, which I think my colleagues have already looked at, so I will let them answer that. Right. We'll just stop the uh, sharing screen. Right, perfect. I, I shall deal with the second question. Oh, sorry, let me stop screen sharing. So the second question is, uh, I'm not sure the forthcoming entitlement obligation to delay payments with a suspicion of fraud actually adds anything to the bank's right to refuse such transactions. But does this entitlement potentially reopen the breach of duty claims because of wider industry practice that will ensue? My response is this, banks have no right to refuse a transaction with their suspicions. The bank is an agent, there's a mandate, there's an act by the mandate. Now, this can be changed if there are specific terms with the customer, uh, which modifies the ordinary incidents of the banking relationship. But if I look at the core case of the ordinary incidents, the bank is in a dilemma because there's a risk of breach of mandate if the suspicions are not reasonable. So if there's some suspicions and it decides, well, I think it's okay, let's just pay the money out, it might be in breach of mandate and there's a complete answer it has to, to repay the customer. It's in the risk, it has a risk of breach of duty if the suspicions have legs. So what this uh, forthcoming uh, amendment does is to create the space uh, for the bank to have some time to make inquiries. This is also relevant to whether a customer is, uh, is grossly negligent if it seeks to claim under the scheme. Because of the, one of the, the relevant aspects of what of the standard of care there is the requirement with regard to interventions. And if the bank stops the clock, looks into it, writes to the customer and says, look, it's suspicious for these reasons, this is an intervention, we think it's a scam, and the customer goes ahead anyway, then there's a real argument there that the customer um, has been grossly negligent and may not, if not vulnerable, uh, be eligible for the £85,000 reimbursement scheme. Yeah, I mean, just, just to add to that, the, the only limited exceptions other than this power to delay, but to allow a bank to outright refuse, and this applies also to other payment services providers, are set out in the 2015 payment services regulations, and they are very limited indeed. They're anti-money laundering, I think serious crime, but as defined in, in that legislation, and then um, I think to do with Section 40G of the Immigration Act, so to do with uh, nationality or residency requirements. Um, but it, it's very limited indeed. And so the other two questions we had, I think I can take them together. Interestingly, both about the uh, Royal Bank of Scotland and JPS, JPSPC4 case. Um, let me just deal with the latter one first. It, essentially, it was an observation about why was this claim not brought uh, in the name of SIOM as a singularis type Queen's Care Duty claim? And would it have had better chances of succeeding if it had been brought in that way? Um, I think that's in principle right, although um, there were you know, difficulties about control of SIOM. And indeed, the fund alleged that SIOM 
was implicated in the underlying fraud. So in principle, yes, I mean, you, you would normally want to look at the singularis type analysis, but it may not have been available on the facts. I'm, I'm sure it was considered given Queen's care was very much on the radar at the time in the sort of conventional singularis sense. And then the other question is, wasn't the issue in this case that they issued against the wrong entity, they should have sought to obtain control of the entity, which was the bank's customer, and then brought the claim in the name of that customer against the bank. It, it, it is essentially, I think, the same question, and I think the answer is yes, but there, there must have been reasons why um, it was at least felt that it was easier or more straightforward, subject to the legal argument as to whether a beneficial owner like the fund could bring this type of claim to do it in the way they did. Um, but I think that's the answer to both those questions. And I think we have a fourth one. Um, I, I'm just conscious of, of the time. It's two minutes past two. I, I think, shall we wrap this to a close? And if there are any questions, I'm sure we can take this offline and you all will have our email uh, addresses. So on that note, uh, thank you very much thank for you. tuning in. Um, we hope this has been helpful uh, and we look forward to you uh, tuning in to the rest of our banking and finance series.